Bear, Marion Engel, read by Torin Atkinson. Page 90. She went upstairs to work. The bear took some time to follow her. She was at her desk when he stood full height at the top of the stairs. She paid no attention to him. She had found an autographed first edition of Major Richardson's Wakusta, inscribed to John Carey with regards in 1832. She wished she had sale-room catalogues to ascertain its value. Meanwhile, she catalogued it and held it for a long time in her hands. It was a rare, rare bird, worth coming here for. There were other valuable books, Boston editions, that were in fact pirated Canadian editions, produced without revenue to English and French authors, but nothing so far to equal Wacusta. Strange, I have never read it, she thought, but I won't read this copy. Get myself a reading copy from Toronto and compare the texts. Well, Carrie, you were somebody after all if you knew Richardson. Lie down, by duck, my bow, she said, for the find had put her in good humor. Then she reached for the next book, shook it for notes, and opened it. Trelawney's Remembrances of Byron and Shelley. She opened it and began to read, for it was not a sacred copy, not a rarity. It was dated London, 1932. Trelawney, the man who burned Shelley's body and saved the heart. Yes, that Trelawney. The pirate, giant of a man, went to Greece with Byron after Shelley died. She began to read, enthralled. She had never read this book before, though the subject interested her. Why? Someone, some scholar, had told her it was a pile of rubbish. Most autobiography is rubbish, she thought. People remember things all wrong. But what amusing rubbish this is. What a man, big, abusive, a giant. A real descendant of the real Trelawney, the one about the 20,000 Cornishmen. Oh, I'll believe he's a liar. Look at the bear, dozing and drowsing there, thinking his own thoughts, like a dog, like a groundhog, like a man, big. Trelawney's good. He speaks in his own voice. He is unfair, but he speaks in his own voice. She sat up and said that out loud. The bear grunted. She got down on her knees beside him. Colonel Carey had left her tiny, painful, creepily paper-saving notes. She was still searching the house to find his voice. She had an odd feeling that Trelawney and the bear were speaking in Carey's voice. Trelawney wanted to find a poet, to know a poet, because he couldn't be one, and he was romantic about poets. He lived to be old. He knew Swinburne and the Pre-Raphaelites. There's some connection there. Carey wanted an island. She was excited. She wanted to know how and who this Carey was. Trelawney, Colonel Carey, the bear... There was some connection, some unfingerable intimacy among them, some tie between longing and desire and the achievable. She lay beside the bear and read more Trelawney, appalling blowhard, savage to both Byron and Mary Shelley. Byron was too sedentary. Shelley couldn't swim. He bought the boat for Shelley. It wasn't a good one. She read about the drowning. Then she skipped to the end of the book. Oh, Christ, he turned the shroud back to have a look at Byron's lame foot disgusting man. All the Victorians, early or late, she thought, were morbid geniuses. Carey was one of them and bought himself an island here. He didn't have Ackerman's views or Bartlett's prints to go by. He sensed what he wanted and came and found it. How did he start wanting it? Did he come entranced by the novels of Mrs. Afra Ben, then move on to Attila and the idea of the noble savage, then James Fenimore Cooper? He came for some big dream. He knew it was going to be hard. There were no servants who had come to the remoter islands. Books were procured with the utmost difficulty, and the tale of their difficult acquisition had probably caused this library to be left to the Institute. But in return for the sacrifice of civilization as he knew it, what did Carey obtain? An island kingdom, safely hedged by books? The dissipation of the sound of revelry forever? Relief from white neckcloths? Or was it simply hope and change? He came, she thought, to find his dream, leaving his practical wife behind him in York. He was adventurous, big-spirited, romantic. There was room for him in the woods. Bear, she said, rubbing her foot in his fur, suddenly lonely. The fire was too hot, and the fur rug had edged towards her. Oh, she was lonely, inconsolably lonely. It was years since she had had human contact. She had always been bad at finding it. 
It was as if men knew that her soul was gangrenous. Ideas were all very well, and she could hide in her work, forgetting for a while the real meaning of the Institute, where the director fucked her weekly on her desk while both of them pretended they were shocking the government, and she knew in her heart that what he wanted was not her waning flesh, but elegant 18th-century keyholes, of which there is a shortage in Ontario. She had allowed the procedure to continue because it was her only human contact, but it horrified her to think of it. There was no care in the act, only habit and convenience. It had become something she was doing to herself. Oh, bear, she said, rubbing his neck. She got up and took her clothes off because she was hot. She lay down on the far side of the bear, away from the fire, and a little away from him, and began in her desolation to make love to herself. The bear roused himself from his somnolence, shifted, and turned. He put out his moly tongue. It was fat, and, as the cyclopedia says, vertically ridged. He began to lick her. A fat, freckled, pink and black tongue. It licked. It rasped to a degree. It probed. It felt very warm and good and strange. What the hell did Byron do with his bear, she wondered. He licked. He probed. She might have been a flea he was searching for. He licked her nipple stiff and scoured her navel. With little nickerings, she moved him south. She swung her hips to make it easy for him. Bear, bear, she whispered, playing with his ears. The tongue that was muscular but also capable of lengthening itself like an eel found all her secret places. And like no human being she had ever known, it persevered in her pleasure. When she came, she whimpered, and the bear licked away her tears. <laughs>